So I'm going to uh, focus on our work over a number of years on insecticide efficacy against alfalfa weevil. And really uh, that's most of what we've done over the years. We've done a few other things with alfalfa weevil uh, biology and management, but we primarily focused on, um, on alfalfa weevil or on insecticide efficacy. Uh, the topics I'd like to cover today, I'd just make a few introductory comments about, uh, uh, about alfalfa weevil in Colorado. Then uh, I'll talk about our conventional efficacy studies. Those, those are the ones we've been doing for many years. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, early treatments and how we got into looking at those. Uh, I'll make a few comments about P. aphids. I haven't heard those uh, uh, mentioned today to much degree. Then uh, we have done some resistance studies, uh, not to the level of sophistication of the Montana group, but we have done a little bit of work in that area. And then I want to finish up by talking about uh, alternative uh, insecticide treatments. Uh, you know, if you run into resistance, uh, you have to look for alternatives. And that's one thing that we've done. So this is a standard alfalfa weevil set of pictures, uh, the adults in the upper left. Uh, the adults uh, do feed in alfalfa, but the uh, damage from that feeding is considered uh, negligible. Uh, the adults are out in early spring laying eggs and stems. The damaging stage is the, uh, is the larval stage and then uh, pupal stage occurs uh, generally between first and second cutting. I thought I'd show you uh, the alfalfa weevil life cycle in Colorado sort of lined up uh, against uh, cuttings, although we, we also have a lot of four cutting alfalfa, but this is roughly what we see. So the adults are present throughout the year. Uh, that would be uh, two generations, one that overwinters and one uh, is out during the summer and overwinters during the following uh, winter. Uh, and several people have made the point that we uh, don't really know what the adults are doing uh, during the winter. There are a number of studies around that tell you that uh, the adults leave the field uh, for the winter, move to sheltered locations, and then come back in the spring. But I think when we start talking about early insecticide treatments, it kind of makes you wonder whether that's uh, the complete story. The egg stage uh, starts uh, during uh, dormancy and moves into early uh, first cutting. The larval stage is primarily a first cutting uh, stage, but uh, we do have larvae that uh, carry over into the second cutting, depending on when, uh, depending on egg hatch and also uh, time of cutting. Then I mentioned the pupil stage. Uh, one other comment about the adults. On occasion, fairly rare occasion, but we do uh, see uh, larval, uh, larval activity in uh, late third or early uh, fourth cutting. And then the, which raises the question as to whether or not we have two generations of alfalfa weevil here, but uh, that's something that we've observed, but have never really uh, nailed down. In terms of damage, uh, this is uh, fairly severe damage in the upper right picture in this slide. Uh, and then uh, that, uh, the appearance of that damage is the result of the weevil larvae feeding on the terminals of the plants. This uh, photo was taken from our uh, 2020 insecticide uh, efficacy studies at our 
research farm north of uh, Fort Collins. And this is about as bad as it gets for alfalfa weevil, which brings me to uh, economic impact. You know, the, the rule of thumb is that we see up to uh, 30 to 40 percent dry matter loss in the first cutting. I, I think that's probably a little high. Uh, when we measure yield and uh, replicated studies, uh, it, the average is closer to uh, 10 percent, and in a bad year it would be in the 20 to 25 percent. So I think that uh, 30 to 40 percent observation, although we have actually measured that in the field, is pretty high for average conditions. The second economic impact is uh, secondary outbreaks of uh, P. aphids and the uh, yield effects of those outbreaks hasn't really been measured, uh, but uh, it is a, a very common phenomenon. And then the third uh, impact that we think is important with alfalfa weevil is if uh, they get on the second cutting regrowth, they can hold that back and keep the canopy open and allow the establishment of weeds, which uh, can uh, considerably shorten the uh, uh, the life of that uh, particular stand. Uh, moving on to uh, efficacy trials, we do uh, generally do just one uh, large efficacy trial, maybe 15 to 20 treatments at our research farm each uh, season. Uh, we've expanded that activity a little bit uh, in recent years. Uh, these uh, plots are 10 by 25 and are treated with a, uh, a wheelbarrow sprayer with a 10 foot uh, boom mounted on it. And all of our uh, samples are taken with a sweep net. And uh, we try to, well, we, we definitely take a pre count, which is an average across each uh, rep. And then uh, we try to take uh, samples, weather permitting, at one, two, and three weeks. Now, the next slide uh, is a summary of uh, efficacy uh, of registered alfalfa insecticides over uh, over about a 30 year period. Now, uh, there have been other insecticides tested, but if they're no longer registered, uh, I don't include them in this particular summary. And there are also a number of insecticides that we've tested that uh, uh, never got registered. In other words, they just reached a, an experimental stage. So this looks like a pretty long list. And uh, you can look at over in the right column and see the uh, percentage control we get. And the uh, number in the parentheses after that is the number of times that that particular treatment has been tested. And so that, uh, that number kind of gives you a um, feel for the reliability of that particular observation. So for example, if you go down to permethrin at uh, two tenths of a pound, we've only made that uh, observation four times compared to uh, looking at the high rate of uh, bathroid, we've done that 20 plus times. So that, we think that's a pretty reliable estimate of efficacy. Uh, you'll also see that several uh, treatments have uh, an early timing as well. And I will get back to those uh, in a minute. But uh, the, I think the main point I wanna make here is that while this looks like a very long list, if you uh, look at it in terms of mode of action, it's really only uh, three modes of action. We have uh, pyrethroids, such as uh, Baythroid or Mustang Max or uh, Warrior. And then we have um, 
organophosphates, primarily Lorsband, but also uh, cobalt. And then uh, Stewart is the uh, third uh, mode of action. So while there are a number of insecticide products on the market, there's really only uh, three modes of action that are in common use. So the next thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is uh, early treatments. And the way we got into this is um, years ago, I was approached by one of the companies and they wanted to uh, look at insecticide efficacy on army cutworm in alfalfa. An army cutworm, uh, is an earlier season pest. And uh, since it's a fairly sporadic problem for us, I, I told the uh, company that we really couldn't guarantee army cutworm uh, populations and measures of efficacy, but uh, we could apply their product at about the time that you would expect to see army cutworm and see what the effects would be on uh, subsequent alfalfa weevil populations. So this, uh, this graph summarizes, I believe this uh, graph has about six years of data in it. And you can uh, see uh, three different uh, pyrethroid treatments applied early. This is about a month earlier than you would be applying for alfalfa weevil compared to a conventionally timed uh, bathroid treatment. And all of them uh, perform very well and um, give you about 90% control. So uh, that's interesting. And there are uh, sort of two uh, practical considerations from this. The first is this uh, provides you the opportunity to uh, combine an insecticide treatment with a herbicide treatment and uh, save a pass across the field and uh, control alfalfa weevil. Uh, I kind of make, make the comment that uh, we don't really have an economic threshold at this early timing. It's, it's applied preventively. And what we think is going on is that we are controlling uh, controlling adults that are present at that time, either from overwintering in the field or having just returned to the field from their overwintering sites. So that's one practical consideration. And the other is uh, the uh, concern that we have about uh, pollinator protection. Uh, insecticide use in alfalfa is a, a very hazardous for uh, pollinators, particularly honeybees. And if you uh, use these early treatments, uh, you will be applying insecticides to the field quite a bit uh, prior to the point where honeybees uh, return and start foraging uh, on the alfalfa. So if uh, pollinator protection is important in your, uh, in your program or scouting activities or whatever, uh, this is an opportunity to uh, uh, to reduce the risk uh, to uh, local pollinators. Uh, one more comment. Oh yeah, um, the other uh, point I wanted to make make is that we have looked at other modes of action with these early applications and uh, have not seen as good efficacy. This. Uh, seems to be limited to the pyrethroids. And I think it's because they have good uh, cool season effectiveness. Okay, so that uh, brings us to uh, P. aphids. And uh, why we worry about uh, P. aphids is uh, shown on this, uh, this graph here. So in the yellow line, we have uh, abundance of P. aphids one, two, and three weeks after uh, treatment for alfalfa weevil. And the blue line uh, is 
uh, abundance of P aphids uh, in plots that were treated for alfalfa weevil. So yellow uh, abundance in untreated plots and blue in uh, treated plots. And this is a very uh, consistent phenomenon. We see this all the time and it doesn't seem to be any uh, really any insecticides that uh, do not have this uh, to some degree or another. And uh, while we don't um, have much evidence, uh, the most likely explanation for this is disruption of biological control uh, at the uh, small plot level. So uh, this is a, a real problem. Uh, it's associated with all of our alfalfa weevil treatments. And we think that the best uh, solution to this particular problem is uh, to uh, select uh, alfalfa varieties that are resistant to P aphids. And there are a number of those. And that will just get you out of the issue completely. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, showing these data to uh, a group of uh, consultants from the eastern part of the state. And one of them asked me uh, whether uh, there was a difference between early and late uh, alfalfa weevil treatments in terms of these P. aphid outbreaks. And uh, I hadn't really thought about it, but I thought I'd go back and take a look at some of our data. So these are uh, six years of data uh, showing uh, P. aphid abundance at uh, with early treatments and the white uh, yellow treatments or late treatments. And then the untreated uh, is uh, in the uh, magenta uh, colored bars. So this uh, slide tells you several things. One is that in uh, five years out of six, uh, P. aphids were less abundant in the untreated plots uh, and the abundance for early and late treatments was generally fairly similar. And then the uh, other conclusion you can draw from, uh, from this is that P. aphids vary uh, greatly from year to year. So that brings us to kind of the status quo. In other words, this is what I've been telling growers for decades now. Uh, first of all, that there are uh, several effective products and that would refer back to that list of uh, insecticides we've tested over the years. Uh, I also tell them that spray volume is important uh, there's a lot of canopy in this crop and getting good coverage can be a challenge. Uh, we generally uh, recommend using uh, higher rates in the southern part of the state. And that has to do with uh, kind of the period of time between when uh, alfalfa weevil uh, Reach, a, reach a treatable levels, and then the time that uh, the crop can be harvested. That, that interval is longer in the southern part of our state. Uh, pollinator protection is important. And then uh, you always have to keep in mind that if you do treat for alfalfa weevils, you will uh, have, uh, most likely have some level of aphid outbreak following. Well, uh, that's, I think, uh, no longer the status quo for us. As, uh, as Kevin mentioned, uh, we, we've had a number of reports of poor residual control. And uh, one, one applicator told me that uh, he had had to uh, treat uh, four times in one season uh, to control alfalfa weevils. So uh, I wasn't really too sure on how to uh, address this. So the way we started 
was uh, we took uh, three insecticides, and uh, that would be uh, Lorsban, Stewart, and Warrior. Took three insecticides, and these uh, these are uh, representative of the three modes of action that that uh, list I showed you uh, boils down to. And we uh, applied those insecticides at our research farm and at two uh, on-farm uh, locations, probably um, 40 miles south, south of Fort Collins. And in this uh, first year, 2016, uh, with one exception, uh, all, all three modes of action uh, reduced uh, alfalfa weevil abundance relative to the uh, untreated control. So uh, because that was not what we expected, I uh, thought we would repeat the same study, and we did in 2017, same locations, same insecticides, same, uh, same rates. And uh, in the second year, all, uh, all three modes of action failed to uh, control alfalfa weevil at uh, both locations. Well, uh, this, uh, this was informative, but uh, the problem with it is that these uh, on-farm trials are expensive and uh, you can't really do a lot of, uh, a lot of locations. So uh, we decided to uh, do some uh, resistance testing. And um, to do that, we needed to uh, develop a, uh, an LD90. I should, uh, should mention that our, our methods are a little bit different than, uh, than the group in Montana has developed, but uh, the idea is generally the same. So anyway, uh, the way we developed these uh, LD90s was to uh, treat, uh, treat a bunch of vials with uh, different, um, uh, different rates of uh, chlorpyrifos, uh, lambda cyhalothrin, and uh, endoxicarb. And um, so we charge the vials with these different rates and then uh, dry the vials. And that uh, machine that the vials are resting on is actually a hot dog roller. And uh, I did get some questions from our purchasing department about why we needed a hot dog roller in my lab, but I got around that eventually. So once, uh, once we have these uh, 10 rates of insecticide in vials, we can uh, uh, put the alfalfa weevil larvae in each vial and uh, measure mortality. And, uh, and after uh, some analysis get an LD90, or which is sometimes referred to as a discriminating dose, one discriminating dose. So uh, these are the uh, rates that we came up with. Uh, in doxycarb, uh, it's, it's really not appropriate to be using uh, treated vials with this insecticide. So we're still uh, lacking an LD90 for, uh, for this uh, active ingredient. Anyway, this is the one we developed for lambdacyhalothrin, and this is the one for chlorpyrifos. And uh, what did I? Well, it's just, uh, oh, I wanted to point out that these were all measured from uh, alfalfa weevils collected from our research farm north of Fort Collins, where based on efficacy data, uh, we still have susceptible weevils. So uh, we had the lambda cyalothrin uh, LD90 first. So our first uh, year of survey uh, is just with, with uh, 
that active ingredient. So we have uh, nine locations, roughly between Fort Collins and uh, uh, Longmont. And this uh, first uh, graph tells you a few things. One is, for example, uh, in the uh, first set of bars on the left, uh, when you ha have those high uh, levels of mortality in the untreated control, that's probably not a good, uh, not a good observation. But the uh, other thing that this graph tells you is that uh, we have uh, uh, a number of, of locations where uh, we have less than 30% uh, mortality in uh, after exposure to this LD90. So that's a pretty good indication of, uh, of some resistance issues. Uh, spread along a fairly uh, large area up on the northern front range. So uh, in the following year, we uh, repeated the lam lambda cyhalothrin and um, a couple of things here. One, we, we still have issues with uh, our untreated control mortality. And uh, also the uh, levels of resistance don't seem to be quite as, uh, quite as high as they were in the previous year. And I think that's, uh, you know, if you go back to those on-farm studies, I think we are uh, seeing that uh, resistance is variable in time, at least, and most likely uh, space as well. Uh, this time we also, uh, we're able to look at chlorpyrifos, and really, uh, in this uh, year, this would be 2020. Uh, we did not see uh, resistance to chlorpyrifos, with one one possible exception at uh, Caldwell. So, uh, a couple of things about uh, our resistance work. I think if we're going to include uh, indoxicarb or Steward we're going to need to uh, maybe move to a leaf disc uh, approach because uh, uh, most of the endoxicarb mortality is uh, after ingestion. So that's one thing. And um, the other thing is that it uh, seems to be uh, fairly clear that uh, we are looking at something that's fairly variable uh, in, in time and space. And it's going to take some effort to really uh, pin this down. So uh, as I indicated earlier, since we have, uh, we do have resistance. So that uh, raises the question as to what uh, can we do about it? And I'm looking at this question just in terms of uh, available alternatives. So uh, these are, most of the labeled uh, insecticides for uh, label uh, insecticides labeled on alfalfa. And um, so among the conventional insecticides, we have one uh, carbamate, uh, several organophosphates, uh, even more pyrethroids, and then indoxicarb. Then we have a couple of uh, mixtures that include uh, lambda cyhalothrin. And then uh, there are some uh, biologicals, whoops. Um, and these include uh, azadiractin, which is a uh, botanical extract. Uh, then we have uh, three pathogens, uh, Bovary bassiana, uh, sold as a uh, mycotrol, and then a uh, chromobacterium, sold as grandivo, and then uh, a Bacillus thuringiensis, but a different uh, subspecies, uh, Galeriae, which is called uh, beetle gone. So we uh, were able to test uh, all of these in uh, 2020. And I wanted to show you some of the results. One, uh, one thing I wanted to show you is uh, we were uh, 
asked by, I think by the, uh, by the manufacturer to include an adjuvant with the uh, steward to improve efficacy. And uh, they seem to have some pretty compelling data that this, uh, this was important, but we were not able to see that importance uh, in our particular studies. Uh, I think the other thing that this, uh, this is our uh, research farm study and uh, really nothing worked very well last year, but if you think back to that damage slide I showed you, it was a, a very heavy uh, weevilly year. But I wanted to call your attention to those uh, treatments highlighted in yellow. Uh, these are the, uh, the alternatives that uh, we looked at. Uh, so, and uh, four of these alternatives would be approved for organic production, which is another reason that we uh, looked at them. But uh, the, uh, the carbamate 7XLR failed completely, as did the uh, three microbials and the uh, botanical. So uh, the alternatives that uh, we were able to look at last year at this location really uh, provided no, no benefit whatsoever. We looked at uh, these same treatments. Uh, well, not uh, we did not have the seven on farm, but we looked at the uh, botanical treatments uh, and uh, microbial treatments on farm, and again with uh, fairly uh, negative results. And in this uh, at this particular location, the steward uh, didn't look that uh, great either. So uh, that's about what I wanted to cover today. Um, this is my contact information. And I did want to point out this uh, particular uh, website that has uh, quite a bit of um, information on alfalfa weevil and other alfalfa pests that uh, might prove useful. And I, <coughs> excuse me, did include my email. I was going to include my office phone number, but I've retired and they disconnected the phone. So that uh, is no longer no longer useful, but uh, feel free to email me if you have questions. I will respond at a retiree's pace. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Jeremiah. Dr. Peters, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for that presentation. If